Well, it's a joy to be here today, and thank the Lord for you folks being here on Sunday night. I, I tell you, I love Sundays. Uh, I think it's vitally important that we have a day in our week that's different. And uh, God made that cycle, didn't he? He said there's a day that's a Sabbath day. We don't obviously have the same Sabbath that they had in the Old Testament. But I do think that Sunday for the Christian is the day that should be different in our life, that we should kind of mark it off as being something, and of course we give most of it over to the Lord, to being in a place where we hear the word of God and we're encouraged because we're getting ready to go back out into the world and face the challenges that are in the world tomorrow in a workplace or whatever your life may be. But then of course we think about not only that, but then it's an opportunity for us to use the gifts and talents God has given to us to serve the Lord in the church. And you know, it's just, it's just important. And uh, I have just, for all, all of my days basically, since I can remember, Sunday has been a, the Lord's Day. And, you know, we just kind of taught that it's just a different day and it's a good, good way to just to spend your week and make it just a, a little bit of a, uh, you know, just a caveat in every week. Hey, it's Sunday. Sunday's coming. It's a good play, way to serve the Lord. And I'm grateful for that. So thank you so very much. I didn't mention to your pastor the, uh, today at lunch that I didn't speak about this this morning, but I, I thought I'd mention it tonight. Of course, uh, Spiritual Leadership Asia, you saw the video, and I would encourage you to go to our website. It's sl-asia.com sl-asia.com. There's information, of course, on the prayer card as well as my business card out there for the website. But if you'd like to see a little bit of the video, the highlight video of 2016, you'll find it on the website. But also there uh, on the website, we're talking about, of course, this big conference coming up. And you can only imagine, if you gather 10,000 people in one place, there's no church over in Manila that's big enough to deal with that. And so we have to rent a venue, and of course there's a tremendous amount of uh, cost that's involved in that. And so one of the things that we're doing as we're traveling, we're sharing with folks that you can have a part in that conference by sponsoring a pastor to come. And uh, there's a partial sponsorship, it's $50, and I, I certainly wouldn't encourage you to do that through the website. I'd encourage you to give that through your local church, and then your church could just basically forward the money on. And so if you're interested in that at all, we'd be glad to talk to you about what's involved in that. There's uh, obviously... Uh, most of those national pastors coming from across Asia do not have the resources that an American would have. And there's no way that if we charge them full price of what it costs us to rent this venue that we could possibly make that happen. And so we're raising resources. I'm personally raising some resources trying to be able to do the work God has called us to do. You know, when you buy an airline ticket, they want money for that. Have you imagined that? That when they get on an airplane, they expect that you're paying a, a fare to go. And uh, so we're raising some support to be able to do the travel that we need to do and fill in a little of the gaps. But we're beyond that, then we're trying to do some other things. And so if the Lord lays that upon your heart in any way at all, uh, you talk to your pastor about that, and I'm sure he can give you some good direction. And again, most of this is just kind of new stuff. You know, we're just kind of really just kind of collaborating, trying to get this thing off the ground. And I can see such great potential, specifically as we get people to work together. I don't want to step over people or run into people. I want to work in concert with folks. And uh, that's what we're trying to do is just to kind of coordinate some things. And that's really part of my responsibility here in America is uh, to try to coordinate some things. We're looking, uh, of course, with First Bible down of, out of Milford. Many of you would be familiar with the term Bearing Precious Seed or that ministry. We've been pre uh, printing Bibles forever. And uh, now they have a ministry where they're trying to get first edition Bibles or to places that don't have a, a Bible. Can you imagine you came to church and we say, hey, turn to the, this particular book and you have a Bible and you can open it up and you can find it. But can you imagine going someplace where they have no comprehension of God's word and to be able to get the Bible into their language and translate it into that tongue so the folks have a resource that they can use, of course, to build strong Christians like God uses his word in our lives. And so we want to coordinate with First Bible and First Word and, and uh, Fellowship Track League, trying to get resources over to Asia. These are all things that we're trying to do in this ministry called Spiritual Leadership Asia, as well as the training and the encouragement and the enablement of the national pastors there. And so again, I would just ask that you pray with us about specifically March 9 to 12 next year. I'll be going over a little bit earlier than that. And then of course we have this big conference. And, and then beyond that, we'll be doing regional conferences in these nations that surround the 1040 window uh, that won't be as large, be as involved. We'll take a few pastors. Uh, the uh, conference in next year, we'll probably have 100 pastors from America coming. Uh, we try to get them a place to preach on Sunday before the conference begins throughout the Philippines and other surrounding nations. And then, of course, they're there for that, that time to be in, in the conference. To, some of them will do some preaching. Some of them will do some uh, conference uh, teaching and things. In the morning, we kind of have personal development, like spiritual leadership conference would be here in America. And then the evening is given over to the kind of the inspirational evangelistic 
uh, you know, let's, 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 let's get a hold of this thing, let's change the world kind of uh, preaching. And so, again, want to encourage you to be praying with us that the Lord just do a great, great work and that he'll give us what we need to be able to do the work that we need to do. So, again, those are just a couple thoughts we'd share with you tonight. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, chapter 3 tonight, please. Proverbs, chapter 3. And we're going to look at a couple of very familiar verses in this chapter. I suppose if I would say to you, hey, uh, out of the book of Proverbs, give me the verse, verses that you're most familiar with. Many folks would say Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Uh, of all the Proverbs, that's probably one of the most familiar uh, Proverbs that are, are found there. And so we want to look at those Proverbs tonight. And, and then I want us to take the chapter and show how that, that proverb plays out throughout this third chapter. So... Would you notice, of course, these very familiar verses, verse number five, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And the him there, of course, is a reference to God, the Lord. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And notice the promise, and he shall direct thy paths. I love that promise. That's a wonderful promise. So I would suppose, again, that many folks would stand up and say, well, I've memorized that verse. Uh, we have a Christian school, that, uh, Heritage Christian School has been in operation since 1975. And every year the seniors graduate, and many times in the yearbook they'll put their life verse, you know, and many of the young people will put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as their life verse. And so it's m memorized, it's, it's quoted, it is, it's claimed, and that's a good thing. And uh, these, are, these are very, very important verses. Yet, I wonder sometimes, do we really know, do we really know what it means to, to trust the Lord completely? And that's what the verse is saying, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Do, do we really know what that means in our life? Can we really say, hey, I'm trusting God in every aspect of my life? And so as we look at verses 5 and 6, we would say, well, that's an admonition. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But in, in some respects, it's not just an admonition, it's a command. See, it's not just a good idea, it's a command that we're to trust the Lord. So notice that word trust, it means to have complete and total confidence in. In this case, Sometimes we talk about having confidence in something, and in this case, it's in someone. It's the Lord. So trusting, trust, of course, is built. It's, it's built on experience. So, so I suppose in this congregation tonight, there would be some men here and some ladies here who say, you know, I've got some confidence in some products. When I was a kid growing up, my parents bought everything at Sears and Roebuck, you know. And uh, we had the Sears and Roebuck catalog, and we went to Sears and Roebuck at West 110th Lorraine. And then they built the big one, the new one, you know, at, 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 uh, at uh, Southland. No, not Southland. Yeah, Southland. Yeah, Southland. Yeah, Southland. 130th there and, and, uh, and uh, Pearl Road. Uh, that was a, man, we, we went there. I mean, we shopped there. And my parents had confidence. My dad had confidence in craftsman tools and uh, Kenmore appliances. I mean, those were, that's Sears and Roebuck. And so that confidence was built on experience. Uh, we may have some Ford people here and Chevy people and, uh, you know, other people who are uh, Plymouth or, well, it's not Plymouth, it's not even an operation anymore, uh, Dodge, Chrysler. Uh, but, you know, we, we build confidence. The young people, it's now Apple. You know, we're, we're technological. We, we're either Android or Apple people. And, and we build our confidence based on our experience. And so uh, we, we build that confidence. And in this case, the believer, the Christian, notice the admonition here, this command is not, not to put your trust in a person, uh, an individual like your pastor or your brother, your sister, your mom, your father. Uh, you know, or, or some, some employer, the Bible says that we're to trust in the Lord, the God of heaven. We're to put our trust in the Lord. And, and he can be trusted. And, and again, our confidence isn't in some human being who has fail, uh, failures and faults, but our, our confidence is in the God of heaven. Now notice the next phrase, with all your heart. So we're to trust in the Lord. That's the confidence. But how are we supposed to do that? Well, with all our heart. And, and of course, the heart in this context is the seat of our emotions. The intellect, our will. It's where we make the decisions that govern our life. So, so what is God is saying to us here? We, we're, when we're determining things, when we're looking at things that are going to make the decisions that are going to make the, the direction of our life, where do we find that direction? Well, we're to find it in the Lord. That's what it says. We're to put our confidence then in, in the Lord. And then notice the next phrase. We're to trust the Lord with all our heart and to lean not to our own understanding. In other words, the, the, the natural inclinations of the flesh, and, and we all have them. Heard in Sunday school this morning, you know, that, uh, that as Brother Bollinger was teaching from the 23rd Psalm, you know, there's a battle that goes on. I have a spiritual part of me, and there's a physical part of me. 
And sometimes the, the, there's a part of me that has a rationale and say, well, this is just what everybody else is doing. And, and sometimes if we're not careful, we allow to lean to our own under, understanding instead of trusting in the Lord. And, and, and so, you know, we realize that we have this inclination towards selfishness and we have a sinful heart. We, it, it sometimes determines our response. But there are things that God says in his words, think about this, that fly in the face of my flesh and in the world that I'm living in. You know, we, we aren't to rely, we're not to rely on our flesh, we're, we're to rely on the Lord here. And, there, and we find the, the, the answers to the, the issues of life that are found in the pages of the Bible. You know, the last few year, years, our world, our culture has changed dramatically. I remember when I was in high school years and years and years ago. It's more and more years as I'm stopping to think about it these days. But I remember as I was attending a public school before we ever started a Christian school, and, and, and I, I was in a public school, and, and it really, it was, it was an affront to me. I was sitting in a, a studies class, and our teacher back in th those days, this was in the 1970s, he said something like this. He said, hey, the best form of government is not a republic like we have in America. It's a socialistic government. And I wanted to get up and smack the guy, you know. I'm a red-blooded American. I've been living in this country all my life. This is the best country in the world. Why would I want to be a socialist? And now we're seeing our whole country is talking about socialism, wanting to change America, to become a bunch of socialists. And I'm thinking to myself, why would I want to do that? But as where culture changes, we're seeing all these things in our culture that are changing. And, and morality has been dumped, and every man and woman is doing that which is right in their own eyes. And, and so the verse number six says that uh, we're, not to, we're, we're to, not to lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways we're to acknowledge him. In all our ways, our path, the, the, the road that we're traveling, not to listen to what the world is saying, but saying, hey God, what do you have to say about this? And make our decisions. Now throughout this third chapter, we, we find some areas that are kind of delineated here where we're supposed to put our trust. In other words, he talks about the trust in verses 5 and 6, but he gives us some very specific chapter where we can trust the Lord. So let's look at them here as we look at this third chapter. Notice, if you would, in verses 1 to 8, we have a, a and it, and it encompasses what we just read in verses 5 and 6, but the idea here is that we can trust the Lord for our future, for our future. Notice what he says in, in verse number 3, he, uh, in verse number 1 of chapter 3, my son. So, so he's speaking to a younger man. So you have to understand, put yourself in a Bible mindset here. As we're looking at the Bible, we want to talk about the context. So we understand that this is Solomon. Solomon is now speaking to his son, perhaps Rehoboam, who's going to be his successor. And, and this is at a time when, when, when uh, Solomon is walking with God. He's in fellowship with God. This is before he's left and turned his heart away from chasing women, uh, strange women who've turned his way, heart away from other gods. But he's talking to his son. He's saying, now Rehoboam, my son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy forsake thee. Bind them upon thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shall they find uh, favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. In verses 5 and 6, we just looked at, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. and all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. Notice in verse number 8, And it shall be health to thy navel and marrow, to thy bones. So what's he saying here, these verses? He's saying, hey, pay attention to, to God's law, pay attention to God's truth, put your trust in him, and you'll have a good future. You'll have a blessed future. Now these promises contained here in this passage are promises made to those who will trust God and live in obedience to his word. So we're setting in an independent, uh, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching Baptist church tonight. We're supposed to be Bible believers and so the world is telling us certain things. And there's a reason the Bible says in the book of Romans to be not conformed to this world. Do you know why that is? Because the world is putting a pressure on us to conform us. So every place you go, there's a pressure to think like they think and to have their values and their, their uh, mindset. And so when the Bible says be not conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your minds, it's supposed to say, well, I'm coming to the word of God and I'm not going to let the world tell me how to live. I'm going to let God's word tell me how to live. I'm going to live by the principles and the precepts that are found in the pages of Scripture, and I know, I know where this path leads. For thousands of years, men and women have walked this path, and it's a good path. As the Bible says, it's an old path. It's a well-beaten path, and it's a path that will take you into your future. The world is telling us to live for yourself. 
You deserve to be happy. Do what you need to be happy. If you're in a marriage where you're unhappy, dump that person and find you somebody that's going to make you happy. And, and, and we're, we're, we're living in this world where all kinds of morality has been turned upside down. Uh, the world tells us to be happy. You need to drink alcohol and use narcotics. That's how you have a good life. Isn't it amazing how they market this stuff today? The, 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 so the devil is the, is the premier marketer. So when he wants to sell alcohol, he doesn't show you the drunk. He doesn't show you the, the bloody highway and the broken glass. He doesn't show you the children that are hungry because dad and mom have used the money on alcohol. He doesn't show you the littered yard with all the trash. No, he shows you some, you know, this fine-looking young man, and, and uh, he's fit and, 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 you know, just smiles, and he's this beautiful woman by his side, and they're holding that, that, that Budweiser, whatever it is, and, hey, this is, hey, you drink this stuff, and you'll look like them. I'm telling you, the devil's a liar. He's a liar. And I'm telling you that, the, uh, that, that, that even among Christianity today, even among God's people today, we're hearing people that say, well, you know, this, this idea of drinking, that's, that's just kind of a, it's a personal matter. It's kind of a personal preference. Well, I want to tell you something. You've been in the, if you've been in the ministry as long as I have, you've dealt with a lot of stuff. And I can tell you, I, there have been calls that I've made that I never want to make again. Your sister. I'll never forget that night that phone call came in. Her sister Cindy had gone away to Crown College and was a student there. She hadn't been there very long. In fact, I think just about a month. Her desire was to get an education, come back to Cleveland and serve as a Christian school teacher. It was a Saturday night. I'll never forget. We were getting ready for revival. Next day, Lou Rossi was in town. My phone rang. It was Dr. Clarence Sexton, president of Crown College. He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but he said, one of your girls from your church was killed in an automobile accident tonight. And I, I'm telling you, I almost dropped the phone. He said, Cindy Douglas. And I said, what? She just left for college. She had gone down the street to a party, and uh, it was a, just a birthday party for somebody in the dorm. One of the church members opened up their house. They had that party, and it was time to get back to school for the curfew. They had backed out of the driveway. They didn't see him coming. He was coming about 80 miles an hour down the street flying, drunk as and high as could be, no headlights on his car, and hit that car broadside, and Cindy was in eternity that quick. I'll never forget walking up on your parents' porch, and I know you'll never forget it. Walking up on that porch and sitting down with those parents, weeping in their, in their living room. Don't tell me that it's okay to drink alcohol. Don't tell me that. I'm just telling you, don't, don't come and t try to tell me that social drinking's okay. It, it'll destroy your life. I'm just here, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you've got to listen to the word of God. You can trust God with your future. Look, I've lived 61 years, almost 62 now. These lips have never touched a drop of alcohol, and I'm living a good life. I, I'm happy in Jesus tonight. I don't need alcohol to make me happy. I've got Jesus Christ. And I'm just saying that if we live by his principles and his precepts, I'm telling you, you can trust the Lord tonight, and, and you don't have to lean to your own understanding. You're there in Proverbs, go to chapter, turn to chapter 23. People have this idea the Bible has nothing to say about alcohol. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. Look at verses 31 and 32. You know, the, the, there's no question the, the Bible is honest. Alcohol appeals to the flesh. There's a part of it that seems glamorous and, you know, make, my, make me feel a little bit better. And yet... The Bible tells us that, hey, yeah, it does appeal to the flesh, but, hey, it's a bite to it. It stings like an adder. Notice what he says in verse 31 of chapter 23. Look not upon the wine when it's red and when it giveth color in the cup. What, what's that saying? That's appeal to the flesh. It's appeal to the eye. There's something appealing about that. It's, it, it's got an attraction to it. He said, look not upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth color in the cup, and when it moveth itself aright, but notice that at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It'll destroy you. Destroy your life, destroy your marriage. I'm just saying that, hey, you can trust the Lord tonight. You know, I, we're, my wife and I, we, we've been married for 43 years, and we, we're far from perfect people. I, believe me, we, you know, we're just sinners saved by the grace of God, and we're still in that development state. We're still being sanctified. 
I'm just simply saying we're far from perfect, but God has been so faithful and has blessed our life. And we are living today where we are living because of the fact that we've trusted God with our life. We've we said, God, we're gonna, we're gonna, we, we came out of Bible college saying, Lord, we just want to serve you. We just want to give our lives to you, and we'll try to live by our, our, your principles and precepts, and we'll try to raise our children by the things of, of the Lord. And by God's grace, we have three sons who are all adults, who are all married, who have given us ten wonderful grandchildren, and they're all doing well in serving God tonight. I'm just simply saying, you can trust the Lord. We just need to trust the Lord. We'll live for him and obey his words. We can, we can live fulfilled and productive life. I, I had no idea 40 years ago, I had no idea when I came out of Bible college that I'd be where I am tonight in life, but God knew. And I'm telling you, he's got a future for us if we'll just trust him. In verses 13 to 20, he, he has promises, and he promises happiness to the man who gets wisdom. No, notice what he says in verse number 13 of chapter 3 of the book of Proverbs, no, going back to where we were. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Now, what's wisdom? Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. That's, that's where you get, get it from the word of God. You get wisdom from the word of God. So what, what does he say there in verse 13? Happy is the man. In other words, you want joy, you want happiness, you find it in, in, in getting wisdom. And then notice what he says in verse 13. Who findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. So wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. And understanding is then putting it into the practical application of your life. So, so I, if I want happiness, if I want joy, then, I, then I'm going to have to follow the, the Lord's teaching here. Verse 14, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things that thou canst desire cannot be compared unto her. Length of days in her right hand and in her left are riches and honor. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness. All her paths are peace. She is the tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, and by understanding he hath established the heavens, and by his knowledge the depths shall, the, the depth shall be broken up, and the clouds shall drop down the dew. So what's he saying? He's just simply saying, hey, there's something in this idea of getting God's wisdom and then putting it into the practice in your life that will give you peace and joy and blessing. It's a good future. You can trust the Lord with your future. Notice the second thing we can trust God with. Notice we find that in verses 9 and 10. You can trust God with your finances. Notice what he says there in verse number nine. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst forth with new wine. What's God saying? He's saying, hey, look, if you honor me, when you look at your life and you look at your resources, you make sure that I'm honored in, in that. And the word honor there means to give weight to. In other words, uh, there's the idea here that God is saying, hey, am I weighty in your life? So that when you get a paycheck, the first thing that you're going to do is say, how much of this is God's? How much of this belongs to the Lord? And what else can I give to him besides that? Honor the Lord with thy substance and the first fruits of all increase. God doesn't want the leftovers. He doesn't wait to say, well, I'll see if I can pay all my bills. And then let me see if I can drop a, a, a few bucks in the offering plate and help the work of God move forward. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, you can trust me, I'm faithful, if you will give me the first fruits of all your increase. I'm just simply saying, it's, it's amazing. I'm amazed how many Christians will tithe. Some, some of them will keep a commitment to the realm of missions until something else comes up. Hello? It's time to go on vacation and we need a few extra dollars. And Well, we're not going to be in church on Sunday, so maybe we'll just take that which belongs to God and we'll use it for ourselves. And I hope you understand that's a terrible mistake. That isn't your money. Did you know that? The Bible makes a statement, and this is Old Testament, New Testament. The tithe is, 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 has been, is now, and will ever, for be, will ever will be. The tithe is the Lord's. It belongs to him. I find people all over the world want to, want to argue with me about that. Well, that tithing, it's Old Testament. Well, I don't find any place in the New Testament where God did away with it. I don't find any place where he said, well, you don't have to do that anymore. In fact, he said to the, the Pharisees, you tithe and you're very precise in what you do, but you've omitted the white, winter things, the laws. These you ought to have done and not to leave the others undone. So, so it's this that the Lord is saying, hey, I'm, I'm telling you that tithing, is, it was before the law, it was during the law, it's still in place today. And I'm telling you, as a person who has lived by that principle, I learned to tithe when I was just a little boy. And, and, and I have to tell you, I learned the hard way. I was a boy going to Cleveland Baptist Church. 
and uh, I, I didn't have a lot of money, and, and it, you know, I, my, my parents would give me some money for the offering, and I remember that very distinctly, uh, one particular Sunday, I had 25 cents to, to drop in the offering. Now, 25 cents doesn't seem like much to us today. You can't even buy a, a Coke at, at this point for 25 cents. Back in those days, you could buy probably two Cokes for 25 cents. So the inflation has kicked in. So 25 cents to a little boy back in those days was a, quite a bit of money. And I was sitting in Sunday school, and one of my friends had come to Sunday school, and he had brought a little gadget that he had bought at a little corner store with him. And he said, he said, and, he looked, and I, he, I said, can I see that? And, and it was, like, this, it was this, like a little toy camera, and you push the button, and when you, when you did the, 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 the lens area of it, it wasn't much, it was just, just a little trinket. It popped open, and this little spring came out. And I was so impressed with that. It was so awesome. I mean, this was a day before, you know, we didn't know what a computer was. We had rotary dial phones, you know, and uh, so we're going back to the old ages, the, the old days, and, and, and so uh, I, I was so interested in that little thing, and I said, well, what does that cost? And they said, 25 cents. I said, really? He said, I can get you one. I said, really? Well, it's supposed to go in the offering, but I don't know that anybody will know, so I gave it to him. And he went and bought it for me, he brought it to, to, to church on a Tuesday night visitation. Some people in this room will remember the name Martha Hirsch. Martha Hirsch was an old lady in our church who knew everybody's business. <laughs> she found out that, that I had gotten that little trinket, and, I, and I, she said, where'd you get that money? Well, I had it for my offering. Well, guess who found out? She told my dad as soon as he got back from visitation. Man, my dad wore me out. He took me home and took me to the woodshed. And I learned that day, the hard way, that you don't take that which belongs to God and spend it on yourself. That was a good lesson for me as a young man many, many years ago. And I'm telling you, from th that day till this day, I've never taken that which belonged to the Lord and said, that's mine, I'm going to use it for myself. And I've always tried to give beyond that. I'm just simply saying... My wife and I were not rich. We are not rich people, but I'm telling you that God is taking care of us through life. He took care of us when we were young Bible college students. He took care of us when we were raising our kids and we hardly had two nickels to rub together and could hardly keep food on the table and shoes on their feet and put them through Christian school. They all got through college. I'm just simply saying, you can trust the Lord with your finances. Now notice the second part of the principle. We were to honor him in verse number nine, but notice verse number 10. So... So what? So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst forth with new wine. I'm telling you, if, you, if, you're, if you're good, you honor the Lord, and you're a good money manager, God will take care of you. That doesn't mean there's not going to be times when, you know, well, how are we going to deal with this? So we've all had those moments when God puts us to the test. But I'm just simply saying that you can trust the Lord, and, you know, was dealing in my heart about stepping out of the pastor. I just knew, I didn't know exactly what he had for us. I just knew that my time at Cleveland Baptist Church was coming to an end. And, and so I, I really began to think about it. I had really had a, like a five-year plan, and, and I knew at some point I was going to be stepping out. And I, and I have to tell you that really finances wasn't a consideration. It wasn't like I'm saying, well, you know, I can't really afford to do that. So that's one of the reasons why pastors don't resign when they should, because they, don't, they, they haven't made preparation for the future. And while I'm not rich and while I haven't, I don't have a ton of money put away, and we don't live in a, in a mansion. I'm just simply saying, I knew that God, I could trust God for the future. Because God's word is always true. If his word is true, that if I'm to honor him, then he's going to keep his part of the bargain. So we need to understand that we can trust God with our finances. There's no question about that. Then notice, if you would, in verses 11 and 12. So we have our future, we have our finances, but we can also trust God with our failures. Look at verse 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Well, that's a good principle, isn't it? So what, what, what's that, when the Bible says, despise not the chastening of the Lord, what, what does that mean? Well, the Bible is very clear that, that if you're a son of God and are a child of God, that you can't just live any way you want to. Now, I don't have to worry about ever whether I'm going to go to heaven or not. I, I, I fear the Lord, but, but the truth of the matter is, I'm still a sinner. Now, I try not to be a, a great sinner, 
that, that should be the, uh, the emphasis, right? We should be trying to live a better life. I, in other words, I should be working at sinning less. Not, I'm not sinless, but I should be working on sinning less. So, but, but the truth of the matter is I'm still a sinner. And, and here's what I find. Immediately when I do something where I cross the line with God, here's what I find. I find that there's a Holy Spirit who says, uh-uh, you shouldn't have done that. You, you know what I'm talking about? You have a Holy Spirit living inside you so that when you cross a line with God, you say something you shouldn't say or you think something you shouldn't think, you do something you shouldn't do. I mean, immediately the Holy Spirit of God ought to be saying, hey, you just crossed the line. Now, when we do that, we respond to the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. We say, oh, you're right, Lord. You know, you're right, I shouldn't have done that. We try to get ourselves right in line. But sometimes we keep pushing the, the mark. Okay, I know I shouldn't have done it, but I'm going to keep doing it. And then the Bible says that, hey, you cross a line enough with God, God's going to bring some chastening. When I was a boy, we called it spanking. God's going to bring some discipline to bear in our life. Just like he did when I was just a little boy, he brought some discipline to bear. My daddy made sure that I understood what was right and wrong as far as our household was concerned. And when I crossed certain lines, I was in trouble with my dad. And I, I guess maybe that I carried that over with my heavenly father. But the Bible here says I'm not going the chastening of the Lord. So in other words, when I get out of line with God, I, I need to understand that God's not angry with me. He's not, he, he's not chasing me because he hates me. He's chasing me because he loves me. And he's trying to bring this correction in my life because he wants what's best for me. Have you ever met somebody? I, I've met many Christians through, through life, and, and there's this bitterness, this, this, if you would, this animosity. And some of it's directed towards people. Some of it's directed towards God because they're upset because of something that's happened in their life. Some of it's because God has brought some chastening into their life, and instead of responding positively to that chastening, they're responding negatively to it. And as a result of that, they're not happy, and they're not where they ought to be. But I'm saying to you tonight, if God has brought some chastening in your life, or God brings chastening in your life this week, it's not because he's angry with you. It's because he's a loving Heavenly Father. He says, I love you enough to correct you. And you notice what he says there. Uh, he says uh, in verse number 12, For whom the Lord loveth, even as a father, uh, he correcteth. Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even a father, the son in whom he delighteth. I have three sons. They're all my delight. I love my, my boys. And I thank God for them. Our oldest son turns 42 next month. And our middle son, who just became the pastor of Cleveland Baptist, is 40, and our youngest son is 38. I remember when they were little kids growing up in our house. When they got out of line, it was a process of discipline. You know, okay, go to your room. I'll be there in a few minutes. And I hated that. I hated the fact that I had to send them to their room, but I hated the fact that if I didn't correct them, I knew that it wasn't going to get any better. Go to your room. I'll be there in a few moments. Go up to the room. Okay, let's have this conversation. What's going on? Why did you do that? And, of course, at that point, there's tears flowing, you know. We have this, this, whole, this whole rigmarole. All right, you know that you did wrong, right? Okay, what's the penalty? I'm going to get a spanking. All right, get over here. Bend over my knee. Where's the paddle? Whack, whack, whack. Now there's more time. All right. It's not like, okay, you're done. It's embrace. I love you. Let's pray about this. Let's ask God to help us. See, there's a process involved in that. Now, I did that because I delighted in my children. I wanted the best for them. Now, if I as a human being will do that for my children, how much more will a Heavenly Father do that for us when we get out of line? He loves us enough to chasten us, to bring the correction into our life, and you can trust him. You can trust him with all your heart. I want you to understand that. So we can trust him with our failures. And then I want you to see in verses 21 and 25, and we'll finish here, you can trust God with your fears. You can trust him with your fears. Notice what he says. My son, let them not depart from thine eyes. and Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life to thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in the way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down. And thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear. Neither be of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. 
For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Now these verses all talk about God and the fact that we can trust him. We can trust him. We don't have to have fear. The thought contained in this section is that the individual who chooses to trust the Lord to have complete confidence demonstrates that by living in the word and walking in practical application of that truth. And it will demonstrate wisdom. Obviously, there will be challenges to that in this world in which we're living. We, we need not fear. Think about that. So we're, we're living in this world today where we're seeing, you know, all this nonsense going on. Just recently in Cuyahoga County, where we, where we live and where our church is located, uh, it was like early in the spring, you know, they're passing this special civil, civil rights thing for, the, for the, the, uh, you know, the LGBT community. And we went down to the county council and stood before the council and we gave our arguments for it. And, of course, you know, and one of the reasons is because there's no, there's no religious exemption. So, in other words, whatever they pass there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be mandated across the, the board. And you know, it doesn't matter if it's in your church. So, so, I guess my question is, so am I supposed to live in fear? No, no, I don't have to live in fear. These things will be challenged. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face some difficulty. It just means that I don't have to fear. So, so, we need not fear. The path is safe. It's a good path. It's a protective path. One where fear is absent. Now, think about it. None of us know what tomorrow holds, do we? Anybody here say, well, I got my plan. I know what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, you don't. At our house right now, my brother-in-law, sister-in-law, my wife's brother and, my, and his wife are at our home. They were getting ready to leave on vacation to go to Destin, Florida with their four grown married children to have a vacation. But her father had a heart attack this week, and he's being lifelighted right now to the Cleveland Clinic. They didn't know that last week. So, so we have no idea what the future holds. And so we're sitting here tonight. We think, well, I know what it's gonna, what's going to happen. Well, you don't really know. So, so you don't know what's going to happen. There, there are young adults sitting here and older teens who are wondering about their future spouse. Who am I going to marry? Are they going to be good to me? Are we going to have a good life? Well, I'm here to tell you, if you trust the Lord, you don't have to worry about that. I'm telling you that, hey, if you put that in God's hands and you trust the God to help you, and, and, and listen, I, here's what I would say to you, kids. If you, have a, if you have godly parents, let your parents help you with this. I'm telling you, your dad and mom have more insight and love for you than, than you have any idea. And, and, and you, may, you may bring somebody home, and, and, and my dad would say this to me every once in a while. I'll bring somebody home, and, and he'd say, what do you see in that girl? Well, I knew then it was over with because, you know, Dad didn't like her. If Dad didn't like her, it must not be. There's something there. And I brought my wife home. He liked her, so we're, we're, shit stuck, you know. <laughs> but, but I'm just simply saying, you know, look, if we trust the Lord, part of it is the process. And, and some of you young people are worrying about the future. You know, what's my life going to be like? You don't have to worry. You can live a, a fearful, fearless life if you trust God with your future. So I've got some other folks here, here perhaps, that are older, and you say, well, you know, are we have enough money to live. How are, we gonna, how are we gonna make it in our old age? I'm here to tell you, you can trust the Lord. You don't have to live in fear. Young couples here raising young children, perhaps you're concerned about the world they're growing up in. I am, I'm a little concerned about it, but I don't fear it. I'm just simply saying we can trust the Lord. So God says, give me your fears, just live right, live for me, live by my truth and I'll take care of you. No question about that. So let's ask these questions. Right. Do we, are we really, truly, are we really, truly trusting the Lord with all our heart? So do you trust him with your future? Are you saying, hey, I'll, I'll live by God's principles knowing that it, when I do at some point, you know, God, you know, barring the Lord Jesus coming, at some point I'm going to get to the end of my life and I'm going to look back and say, hey, it's been a good life. It's been a blessed life. I don't mean it's not had some cares or some worries along life's way or some difficulties along life's way. I'm just telling you that, hey, God can get us to the future. How about your finances? Are you trusting God with your finances? Are you trusting him with your failures tonight? As he brings chastening into your life, are you receiving it properly and responding to him in a way that makes his chastening profitable? And are you trusting God with your fears? I don't know what you're fearful about tonight. But I'm here to tell you that you don't need to fear. You can trust the Lord. He'll take care of you. Let's bow our heads together in prayer tonight.